Hey, do you want to be a superhero on your next ASP.NET project? Of course you do. Stay tuned to find out how. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Code Hour. This is episode 33, and actually, it's a little bit less of an episode and more of a presentation. It's going to be 60 minutes instead of my traditional 30, but it's totally going to be worth it. I hope you'll stick with me because this is going to be on abp.io. If you're a regular subscriber of my channel, you'll know I do a lot on ASP.NET Boilerplate. And ABP.io is the next version of ASP.NET Boilerplate. So let's get into what is it. First of all, similar to ASP.NET Boilerplate, it is a one-time code generator that generates a .NET Core backend and of one of three different front ends, either Angular, ASP.NET Core MVC, or Blazor. So already you can see some differences. By the way, this is going to be for an audience that does not necessarily know what ASP.NET Boilerplate is. But if you do, and you know a lot about it, then I'm going to be drawing a lot of comparisons. So hopefully I can address both audiences if you've never heard of it or if you are familiar with the V1. So the second thing it is, is a framework. So it pulls down code from NPM and NuGet. And one difference here is that ABP.io is a little bit heavier on the framework and a little bit lighter on the one-time code generation. And the consequence to that, the benefit really, is that as an ABP.io user, you're going to more easily be able to get new, fresh content, bug fixes, and features as they ship them out. What's it for? It is for new projects and not existing projects. If you have an existing project, just stick with what you've got. Uh, and what does it give you? It gives you three main things. It gives you an end-to-end, 100% working site right off the bat. It's a huge benefit because you can get up to speed fast. You can be a superhero on day one. It also gives you a whole bunch of foundational features. That's going to be the core of this presentation, what those are. And it gives you a whole bunch of best practices. So let's before I get into the foundational features, let's talk about the history of it was originally, as I mentioned, ASP.NET Boilerplate. If you're familiar with the terms in ASP.NET Boilerplate, there was the ASP.NET Boilerplate, which was the free and open source version, and then there was the ASP.NET Zero, which was the paid version that allowed them to make money. So the uh, they being Volosoft is the name of the company that, that provides this. Now, the new terms are the ABP framework is the free and open source version of it that you can start your project on. Or if you want more features, then you can use the ABP commercial and support. And taken together, those two things are ABP.io. So why did we need a whole new version of ASP? Not boilerplate. What was wrong with the old one? Well, the answer is that the original one was written in 2013, seven years ago, or by the time you're watching this, eight years ago. It's probably be 2021. And that was written even before Angular 2 was a thing. So this has got some, it's got some technology history to it. And, and from a maturity perspective, that's a benefit, but it also has some disadvantages. And one of the, if you watch my episode 19, you'll know that I complained a little bit about the dependency injection technology that they use. And so when ABP.io came out in 2019, it was based on .NET Core. It came out with .NET Core 3. And so rather than using an, any old DI framework, they were able to use what was built in with .NET Core. So it got some advantages there. A while ago, I asked Halil Ibrahim Kalkin, who is the lead developer on ASP.NET Boilerplate, I said, hey, um, what is the lifespan of ABP, ASP.NET Boilerplate? Is there an upgrade path to ABP.io? And, and he said, hey, we're going to create a migration guide, which they have done. And he said, there's no end of life plan for ASP.NET Boilerplate yet. That is still true today. So you could still choose either one that you wanted to do. And that migration guide, I have a link to it. I don't know, here or maybe here. Uh, 
Um, and that migration guide is going to be a, a, a good starting point. I haven't actually done it, so I can't guarantee that it's going to be easy to do. In fact, it looks a little time consuming. If you're planning on upgrading, give it some time, I think. So it's still open source. That's fantastic news. Here is their GitHub page. As of today, 4.9 thousand stars after already having been around for a year. That's pretty good. By comparison, the ASP.NET Boilerplate older version had 9,000 stars. So if you're considering whether I should start my next project based on this sketchy technology, it's, it's mature. It's been around a long time. It's based on something that's even more mature and been around even longer. So that's good to know. By the way, ASP.NET Boilerplate has over 1 million downloads on Nougat. So that's a popular framework. Let's talk ABP commercial real quick. And I think it's important to talk about this from two perspectives. If you, even if you're planning on using the free version, it's worth knowing what you are not getting if you choose not to go commercial. And it's also worth remembering that if you have the ability to pay for it, you can help support this technology. And even if you don't, there are other people that are supporting it. This company, Volosoft, is making money. And so you know that they're going to be around for a while. And that's really important. So some of the features that you do not get with the pro version include these fancy themes. So they have UI themes. ASP.NET Boilerplate just had one theme you got to choose from, but there's multiple UI themes. The ABP suite gives you the ability to, to do CRUD generation from front end to back end with just a couple clicks. At least that's what it looks like. I haven't tried it out yet. It looks pretty awesome. Okay, so we talked about themes and the ABP suite and support as you would expect. And then the last thing is modules. And so modules covers a big swath of things because modules are a uh, concept that is introduced by ABP, not a new concept, but it's a concept that they allow you to bring in bits of functionality. And there's a lot of different modules in ABP.io and you get additional ones and beefed up ones when you pay. So the, uh, here's, here's, just digging through their website a little bit, there is, a, you get identity server integration even if you're doing the free version, but it, you get like a fancy UI if you're doing the, the paid one. There's Twilio, SMS integration, stuff like that. You can all code all this stuff yourself, but it just will be a, a helpful accelerator if you go for the paid version. Digging into some of these a little bit that say basic and pro, the account management I think is interesting. So you still get login, registration, multi-tenancy. I'll talk about all these later. The user lockout, these are all great features. You get passwords, social login. What you get extra on top of that is um, you get two-factor authentication, email confirmation, email verification, LDAP integration. So that's all cool. Now, let us dig into the benefits. Now, Hopefully, I'm going to convince you in this section that it's worth sticking around for the rest of the 60-minute presentation. So I'm organizing the benefits by day one, week one, and month one, what you can expect and how it will benefit you to choose this framework. So first of all, this is the site that you get right on day one, immediately. You get identity management. You can create, edit, update, delete users, roles, and the permissions that are associated with them and multi-tenancy. Multi-tenancy is huge. I did a whole episode on multi-tenancy. Um, I think it was like episode 21 to check that out. But the multi-tenancy is very similar. So if you watch that other episode, it was based on ASP.NET Boilerplate, but it will be very, very similar for ABP.io. So this is what you're going to get right out of the day one. And you can come back to your boss and say, boss, check this out. I got this working. I got this edit functionality and uh, already login and, and the ability to, to do all of that. That's going to be fantastic. And uh, then by the end of the first week, you might have your first entity and the ability to view, edit, update products already pretty quickly. And your boss will say, well done. That is very impressive. And you could say, well, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I've got this fantastic technology that I'm using. Or, yeah, it could be just uh, take all that glory for yourself, right? Why not? 
So the Beak One benefits are you get all these foundational features, you get the pre-implemented best practices. Uh, didn't mention domain-driven design, but it is all everything in ABP.io is based on domain-driven design, and that those concepts are beefed up a lot more so than they were in ASP.NET Boilerplate. And the documentation is really very, very good, and so that gives you the ability to get up to speed quickly on their framework, and they're always focusing on getting the documentation good, and that's really a huge benefit. So at the end of the first month, hopefully you've got a site, I would hope. This was a site that I built, I don't know if it took a month, maybe it took a couple months, but this is one that I actually built based on ASP.NET boilerplate, but this is something that you might be able to, to generate and that would be fantastic. It's based on an enterprise grade architecture. So this isn't just your like quick and dirty Ruby on Rails project. This is something which is going to be a platform, something that you can build on over time, something that's going to be able to last, enterprise grade. And uh, I talked about documentation before, but it's also really useful from a more longer term perspective because if you have new developers that join onto your project, then they can get up to speed faster as well because of that documentation. And if you have multiple ABP.io or ASP.NET Boilerplate projects within your organization, or if you're a consulting company, which is who pays my, my bills uh, from a day-to-day -day basis, then, and, and they have multiple ASP.NET projects, then, the, then you have the ability for developers to move in and out. Once they're up to speed on ABP.io, they can move in and out of multiple different projects because they're all going to be similar. You can, you can customize them. So that's cool. That's enterprise consistency. And it's another benefit of that documentation that you're liable to see further down the road. All right, this is the fun stuff. Let's get into the foundational features. So I've organized this into four different areas, the front end, the back end, deployment, and testing. It's a little bit hard to talk about the front end because there are three different front ends. There's Angular, ASP.NET MVC, and Blazor. And if you saw the last presentation that I did, last code hour that I did, I did a Angular versus Blazor. So hopefully you're already prepped up to, to make that decision between the two. Actually, since I recorded that, Blazor 5 was released and it fixes a whole bunch of things that I complained about. Blazor, um, I think Blazor is probably pretty, uh, pretty good choice for a new project today. But I have a lot of Angular experience and so I'm going to focus a little bit more heavily on Angular in this presentation. But those are the three different benefits. I'm going to talk about a little bit about what you get with them generically. So for instance, tag helpers, this is something that applies more to ASP MVC, ASP.NET Core MVC, um, but there's also something similar in the Angular world and probably in the Blazor world. And so what you can do is uh, over here, you, have, you can do like an ABP-input, that tag helper then gets translated based on the model, it looks over here at the model and sees, okay, I've got a required password, for instance, and it knows without you saying the data type or the description or whether the validation, it knows to automatically populate it like this. And that's really nice. It knows if you have a bool to automatically generate it as a checkbox. And if you have dynamic forms, if you use this ABP dynamic forms, it just generates all of those for everything. So that's a nice helper, and if you don't end up liking it, you can get rid of it and swap it in with custom code. So that's an example. The data table is really nice. Here's the Angular data table. This is new, but it gives you filtering, sorting, and pagination right out of the box. There is a bunch of miscellaneous things, too. There is pop modal pop-ups that you can customize, and there's a toaster they have built in that's attractive and works nicely. All very cool. Localization works front end to back end. Here's how it looks on the well, here's how it looks on the on the back end. So the, the way localization works, you have now it's slightly different in ABP.io, but you have a bunch of JSON files and each one is for a language, and then inside of those you put in a, basically a dictionary name value pair. And then in your front end, you just pipe it in Angular anyway over to ABP localization. And then you can even parameterize it. So check out this. Are you sure you want to delete, you know, the Sarshim Pro, uh, Pro Edition or something like that? And and that product name gets plunked into there. So that's nice. 
Let's talk security. This is a little bit complicated, takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's super powerful and wonderful, and it's a huge, huge benefit of ABP.io. When you, actually, this is a little bit different. Check this out. What is funny about this? If this is the home page that you go to, and you click the login button, and you go over here, do you notice anything funny? There's URLs. There's URLs, so 4200 is what Angular serves up, and 44360 is what the backend ASP.NET Core serves up, which is traditionally, typically, most of it is an API. This is not an API, this is a page. And the reason that they did that is it's part of OAuth 2. It has better identity server support and supports the proof key for code exchange, PKCE protocol. And one of the benefits is that if you generate the mobile site, and I mean covered that, but you can generate a, a mobile application in React as part of ABP.io2, which is really cool. But if you've got a mobile site and you've got the web front end and maybe you have different front ends, they can all go to the same place for login that provides tokens. And then that is what everybody uses, one central place. As far as routing and authentication, this is a slight difference the way they did it in abp.io. The, the routing table is done by modules, and so the module goes and looks over at the product routing module. And then there is, from a security perspective, there's an auth guard and a permission guard. If you toss in the auth guard, it'll automatically only allow access to that route if someone has logged in. And if you put the permission guard, then you can put a required policy, and someone can only log in if they have this permission. And I will get into what permissions are a little bit later. Talked about multi-tenancy a little bit just to give you a sense of what that looks like. This is the ability to switch switch tenants. And if you're not familiar with the term multi-tenancy, imagine you have a bookstore and you're you're selling books and then you realize that you've you're don't want to just be a single bookstore. Maybe you have a whole bunch of bookstores and each one of them has their own set of books and you want each one of them to have a sort of a slice of your site, a version of your site where they sell their own books, they manage their own users, they manage their own everything. And, th and then that's a, that's a really good example of having multiple tenants that are all using your site and that each one of them's ver view of the data is different. It's a, it's a hard, it can be a hard problem to solve and abp.io kills it. It makes it so much easier. If you're using multi-tenancy, if you have a need for multi-tenancy on your project, seriously consider abp.io to make your life so much easier. And this is how it works. You can inherit from our multi-tenant and then you get a tenant ID and it automatically manages only showing data for the currently logged in tenant. If, if you don't need it, there's a go into the multi-tenancy consts and turn is disabled to, to false. Okay, auto-generated service proxies. I love this feature, especially for Angular. It's wonderful. So it comes with Swashbuckle by default, which is a, if you're not familiar with Swashbuckle, it's a product, it's an open source technology that is part of the .NET framework, actually. So you know it's supported. It actually comes out of the box, I believe, with ASP.NET Core, but it's all hooked up with abp.io to give you a Swagger site, which is documentation for your APIs. Love it, it's wonderful. But ABP doesn't stop there. <laughs> they give you the ability to generate all of the all of the objects, all of the strongly typed objects into TypeScript. So you get all that nice IntelliSense. And then in addition, that proxy also gives you the ability to call into your backend with vir typing virtually any code, no code. Um, the way you do it, by the way, is with a, a .NET tool called Volo ABP CLI. And that tool, I'll be using it when I show, demo this in a little bit, but that tool is going to allow you to generate the proxy in addition to generating the site. And this is what the code looks like, at least from an Angular perspective. You can do this.productservice.get. You can pass in whatever it needs and dot .subscribe and, and all that code. That's all you need to type. All the code to make that work is pre-implemented for you to call into the back end. Wonderful, wonderful feature. Saves a ton of time.
All right. Um, I don't know. Is it? Well, I don't know if it's time. Maybe I should just demo. Is it time to do a demo? I think it's time to do a demo. Let's do it. So if I were to start this right now, I'm going to go to abp.io and get started. And when you do that, they give you two different ways of doing it. You can do it with a CLI, which is the way I'm going to do it now, or you can get a direct download. And the direct download is kind of cool. You can just say, this is Lee's store, sure, Lee's store three. And then I want this to be an application. I want this to be based on Angular. And oh, oh, I didn't even mention this, but there's Mongo support as well. That's another big benefit of abp.io. If you don't really want to use a traditional database with relationships between them, Mongo is an option. So that's cool. And oh, and yeah, there, there's that mobile component. Um, you can generate a React native mobile app. You might be missing, by the way, from ASP.NET Boilerplate, other UI frameworks. They no longer have the React there, but I believe they are working on that. They don't have, currently have the React, and they don't currently have the view. All right. And so you could just create now, and you could download it. Or you could do it using the CLI. So that's what I'm going to do. When you do run this, you do need to run it as Windows PowerShell as admin. Or if you're on a Mac, of course, this all works on a Mac, too. And if I type that right now, I think it's not going to work. Oh, well, it's already installed, but if I uninstall it, yeah, I get this error. It turns out that between the last time I ran through this presentation and now, Volosoft has released the version that is compatible with .NET 5. So that's fantastic, and uh, we're running some fresh bits here, and I went and installed .NET 5. So let's go and run the .NET tool install again with .NET 5 installed. Awesome, we've got 4.0.0.0. All right, and with that installed, now the next trick is to run ABP new and with minus minus help and see some examples of what the options are. All right, so we're going to do .NET new. We'll call it Lee's Store 3, and front end is going to be Angular. We do not need the React Native mobile client, although that would be cool. Um, we want a database. Uh, we don't need Mongo, so the default is Entity Framework EF, and that's just fine. We'll leave that as the default. Uh, the last thing is it's kind of convenient to do to specify the connection string. Their default connection string is goes through an instance. I, mean, I don't have an instance. There we go. We got an Angular and ASP.NET Core. Let's open the Visual Studio up and take a look at that project. And I'm going to just do a quick walkthrough of all of the code that is provided in the back end. And meanwhile, I'm going to open up the front end and start downloading the internet. Oh, and they used yarn rather than npm for this for ABP. And so you can just do yarn and it will download the internet for you. That's going to take a long time. So while we're waiting for that, I'm going to switch back over to Visual Studio. And I'm going to go over the solution. So the thing you care most about, probably, because it's the front end, the sort of thing to look at first anyway, is the app HTTP API host. And that project is the traditional ASP.core MVC project. And that's the thing that you want to be your startup project. So in general, when you're ready to start a new project, you can right click on that and and then hit the A button and it'll set a startup project. And you can hit F5 and it'll run. However, we don't have a database yet. And so we need to create a database. I'm going to switch over to SQL Server. I've got SQL Server installed here. I'm going to create a new database called Lee's Store 3. And as expected, there are no database tables in there. We need to get some database tables in there. And to do that, we run the DB Migrator. So that's the other project that's important inside of the abp.io set of projects. Now, if you're looking at this from the ASP.NET Boilerplate perspective, you're thinking, gosh, there's a lot of projects there, a lot more than there used to be. So let me just go over them real quick. There is an HTTP API, which is equivalent to the one that used to be called HTTPAPI.core, and that is where if you need controllers, if you want to write controllers, which might be useful if you're doing file upload or file download, then HTTP API is the place to put those. This is new. HTTPAPI.client is the ability to define an external facing API, either for separate customers that are not your web application, or for maybe if you have a command line 
tool that needs to have get access to it, or a desktop app, or your web app, or you know some some other or mobile app, some some other thing. And actually, I did a whole episode on this at some point, and uh, two episodes. And in those episodes, I show how to do that in ASP.NET Boilerplate. It is completely changed in ABP.io. They've built it into the framework. So you don't need two episodes of Code Hour to figure out how to do that. I'll probably do one in the future if you're interested. Write in the comments if you like that. Well, let's talk about the migrator. So the migrator is a really useful project for running your migrations. Now, you could just do it from the, the command line. You could go into the package manager console and write and run update database. And that's fine. It'll run your migrations and it'll do just do just fine with it. You'll need to make sure to change the default project to DB migrations if you were to do update database. However, I would encourage you to use the DB migrator. Two reasons for that. One, the DB migrator will, if you have, if you're doing multi-tenancy, watch my episode on, on multi-tenancy, and there is an option there to have one database per tenant. That is supported with the DB migrator, and if you have multiple databases, that is, that is not supported with the update database command. So that's one reason you should probably use the DB migrator. The other is, and this is cool, there's a new feature in ABP.io for seeding your data from inside of C Sharp. Normally, if you want to seed data, you have to do that inside of a migration with insert commands, but uh, the DB migrator, um, and I'm not going to show it as part of this presentation, but it's a thing that you can do. It's actually in the startup sample if you go through avp.io and you go through their, their sample project then that is they show you how to do that there so i'm going to run the db migrator let's just talk about some of these other projects the application here the application is where you define your app services so these are like controllers in traditional asp.net mvc but uh, but but instead they give you additional functionality and found it and it's part of the domain driven design architecture so that's the application the contracts is where you would put all of your interfaces the domain is where you put all of your entities the domain.shared is where you put enums things like enums also i believe that is where the localization is so localization goes that's where all of those json files i showed earlier are located the entity framework core is where your data context lives if you're using entity framework there's the data context and then the data migrations have been separated out and now they live in the db migrations project so those are all of the projects now let's see did that run good news that ran successfully or so it says so it claims let's find out for sure i'm gonna zip on over to the store three and refresh the tables and hopefully we see a whole bunch of there we go a whole bunch of ABP tables that's good that will help us enormously when we try to run this thing set the host as the startup project let's see if the front end has completed downloading the internet yes it has your current version of yarns out of date but I don't think that's a big problem so next if you follow their documentation they tell you to do yarn serve or something like that but it's the same thing as doing ng serve if you've installed angular at the minus g at the global level okay there we go that took a while that i don't know why that took so long uh, but it, it says it's running on localhost 4200 so let's see if the front end is working Huzzah, that's a good sign we see a lease store three up there in the title an error has occurred HTTP failed to get to 44392 and i think that's because i started i failed to run the back end so I set that as the startup project, and let's just check the app settings.json. Hopefully, this contains the same database that uh, I specified at the command line. Yep, that's good. That's a good sign. And by the way, when I ran the DB migrator, I forgot to mention this, but inside of the app, it has its own app settings.json. That's where it looks to run the database migrations into that database. Control F5 to start without debugging because it's a little faster that way. Hey, there we are. There is the Swagger file, and I could go and try to ask it for, you know, give me a list of roles, for instance. And I probably would expect this to fail with an unauthenticated response. Yeah, 401 unauthenticated. Well, Let's check back with our Angular front end and see if that's working now. 
Excellent. At least our three is successfully running. Let's log in. And here's the login page, and I can get a admin and password account from there it is. One Q two three four five whatever. Okay, and we're logged in. So you can tell we're logged in because now we can go up to this administration tab that showed up. We can get in and take a look at the users, the roles, the tenants. We can see, for instance, that there is an admin account. We can create a new one called B Smith. So that's how that works, and that is roughly what a, a site looks like right out of the box. Okay, we're back. That was the demo. So let's talk about some backend features. I haven't gotten into this in detail yet, but there's a app service which is associated with each entity that you would want to expose CRUD for or other things. Uh, maybe a, an increment quantity or decrement quantity or make sale method and you would put that onto generally onto an app service. It's like a controller but it has more functionality. And so this is an example of one such uh, thing and let's just take a look at it bit by bit. First of all, the products app service here in this example inherits from CRUD app service. You can just inherit from app service if you want, and that will give you virtually nothing, just in this example, an increment quantity. But if you inherit from CRUD app service, then you get create, read, update, and delete methods without any coding at all fully implemented. That's, that's great. That's a lot of functionality saved. You also get dependency injection for free, already set up, and it uses convention-based determining of what, what the teams inherit from. So this is just asking for an I repository, which is talking about the repository pattern, which is a great way of accessing the database in a unit testable and independent modular way. So it's a great pattern. And uh, the dependency injection, by the way, if you were to define something called a products, I products app service, and a products app service, and you ask for the iProducts app service, it will know, it will use convention to figure out that you want the products app service. The authorization here is declarative, and I'm going to get into, again, I've, I've touched on security a little bit, I'm going to dig into it a lot more in just a second, but you get to put at a high level, I would like, and nobody can get into this method unless they have, in this case, the view edit products permission. You can define whatever permissions you want. Validation happens automatically. That's really nice. If you take a parameter that's a product DTO, data transfer object, it'll automatically validate it before it even gets into your app service. There is audit logging, which you can turn on. And so that type of logging says anytime a method call happens, it'll save it into the database. So you know, it could be useful from security perspective. Logging, awesome. It's set up for Log4Net by default, which is just great. It's one more thing you don't need to set up when you're starting a brand new project. It uses unit of work transactions, unit of work pattern, transactions, and connection management automatically. So it, you don't need to worry about any of that. If you throw an exception in the middle of this increment quantity, for example, it'll automatically, anything that's happened up until that point, it'll automatically roll it all back and it won't, it'll be like it's never even happened. So that's, that's, that's great stuff that you're getting right out of the box. Uh, talked about exceptions a little bit. You can also throw these user-friendly exceptions, and these are cool. A user-friendly exception, uh, well, normally when an exception happens, it'll return a HTTP 401 or you know, 40, I don't know, it'll return a, maybe a 400 response back to the server, and it'll pop up a real pretty nice um, modal dialog to the user that just says a generic message because you don't want to expose any of the internal details of your application to the user. But if you throw a user-friendly exception, whatever the text of the string is there will get popped up to the user. It's just a nice convenience functionality and localization supported as well. You just pass in L and say which key you want. It'll automatically pick up the value and determine which language it should be based on the user's connection, user's HTTP headers and such. Uh, it has object mapping. It uses it uses auto mapper by default, and there we go. That's kind of a real quick overview of all the backend features, but there's so much more. Let's dig in more detail into permissions. So there are there's multi tenancy, which is built in throughout, 
And then there's users, the concept of a user, obviously, straightforward. There's uh, that Bob Smith account that I created earlier, for instance. There are roles, so you could create a supervisor role, that's right out of the box, and you can associate the two. So you can say, B. Smith is a supervisor, or B. Smith is a supervisor and a something else. And then there's these permission things. So permissions, you create those yourself inside of the lease store or whatever, permission definition provider. And so here's some code sample that's creating a new permission called view edit products. And it uses localization to get a nice descriptive name, which we'll use in the UI. And then the final parameter is whether you want it to be just for the host, just for the tenant, or for both host and tenant. You can then decorate, as I showed earlier, you can decorate your classes or your methods. Actually, you can decorate controllers too with an authorize attribute and pass in as a parameter that permission that you just defined. And that locks that down to only allow people within that permission. But how does ABP know which user, which permissions the user has? Well, that is tied between the role and the permission. So when you go in and edit a role, you can, after you've defined some permissions, you can say which, the user can say which permissions the user has. So this is that view edit products permission that we added now showing up in the UI. I hope that makes sense. You have to fiddle with it for a little bit before you get a feeling for it, but it's really powerful. It's really wonderful. I love the permission management, the way they did that. I talked a little bit about validation, but just to get into a little bit more detail, if you have a create product DTO or something which is exposed back to the user, then you can use annotations built into .NET you can use required length range. There's a whole, there's a regex, there's a whole bunch of those. And when it's going into an app service, abp.io will validate that DTO. And if it doesn't look good, it'll return a nice validation message back to the front end. Here's custom validation, an example of custom validation if you inherit from iValidatable object. So that's really nice to do more complicated validation than you can do just in, in your regular Angular whatever front end. So there's auditing. This is a wonderful, fantastic feature. If you inherit from audited aggregate root or full audited aggregate root, or there's a couple other variations, then you will get a creation time, creator ID, last modification time, last modifier ID, and potentially if you do full audit aggregate root, which I'll show in just a second, then you also get a deleted by deletion is deleted. And abp.io will automatically fill in all of those values. When you create something for the first time, it'll fill in the created. When you modify something, it'll fill in modified time, but it also, because it already has the context of the security, can figure out who it was that did it. So it can automatically fill in for you the creator ID or the last modifier ID or the deleted ID who took the action. And that's wonderful. As far as deletion goes, the deletion side of that story, if you inherit from full audit aggregate root or I soft delete, then you get these is deleted field. And then when someone goes into the UI and they delete something, you delete it just like you would normally in code, but instead of hard deleting it, it just fills in the is deleted into the database. So is deleted becomes one in this case. And whenever you pull data back out, there's a filter and ABP will automatically exclude anything which has been soft deleted, which is a really cool feature. If you still want to be able to get the soft deleted things, you can turn off that filter with like this, data filter dot disable I soft delete. And that will allow you to pull back things that have been soft deleted. That's auditing, it's a great feature. As far as logging goes, this is a really important gotcha if you're using ABP. And that is because when you're running the site, the user never sees the details of what the error message is, what the exception is. It's best practice, right? It's a good thing to do. But how do you find out what the actual error was? The answer is that all errors automatically go into the logs, which go through log4net and get stored in this location, ASP.NET Core, 
whatever your application name is, HTTP API host slash logs slash logs.txt. So personally, the way I work is I just keep a tail running on that all the time because I'm always just keeping an eye on it. And I use a tool called Beartail to do the tail, but you could use PowerShell, you could use Visual Studio Code, whatever you want. And uh, I just like this tool because it also does color coding and things like that. And uh, one thing that's new about abp.io is it's also logging, in this example, uh, sorry for the fuzziness, it's also logging all of the queries that are being executed. And that's great for keeping an eye on performance. Nice update there. And there's a whole bunch of other miscellaneous things that are really cool. So it has Signal R built in. It can do background jobs that are like long running tasks, which web applications are typically not very good. They're not designed for it. But there's a facility in .NET and ABP exposes it and makes it even easier to use. There's an event bus which you can use and, and turn on via a module. It uh, uses RabbitMQ under the covers, but you can change which uh, message queuing technology you want. That's pluggable. I mentioned data seeding. I'd love to give an example, but there's not enough time. Modules. So modules are a great feature for pulling in different bits of functionality, and you can define your own module back in C Sharp. So it's a really sweet, sweet way of organizing code, and you can tie into the startup and shutdown lifecycle of the modules. It's got email. It's got text templating. It's got this whole virtual file system. So if you have an image or something that you want to expose back out to the front end, you can plug that into the virtual file system and it'll treat it just as if, even though it's an embedded resource, it'll treat it as if it's available for the front end to pull. It's a new feature in abp.io. That's really cool. So that's the meat of it. That's the important stuff. We've talked about the front end, the back end. From a deployment perspective, there are a there's a whole new microservices project demo project that you can take a look at and they've shown you how you can hook it up with kubernetes which is what i'm doing on my actual project with asp.net boilerplate and uh, docker and identity server hooking up a redis cache and, and pulling and sending this how it's actually going to potentially look in production with a big sophisticated microservices architecture that's really cool one thing they don't do, unlike ASP.NET Boilerplate, there's no Docker files built in. You have to either steal those from the demo site or build them yourself. And I, when, I, when I did my microservices site based on ASP.NET Boilerplate, I had to do everything from scratch anyway because I, I, it was very custom to what my customer needed. I mentioned the migrator, but I think I just want to talk about it just a, a second more. One other thing that's really nice about the migrator is that project, that command line project, can be compiled. And if you've got that in a CI CD server, you can, comp and you're using, let's say you're using Azure DevOps, you could have a multi phase pipeline, and you can have phase one of it compiling that migrator and storing it as an asset. And then phase two, which runs in your dev environment, then you can run that migration. And then let's say a week later you validated it and someone runs it in the test environment. Then they run that exact migrator and it runs just those migrations in the test environment. And then you can do the same thing in your pre-prod and your prod. And do that for each of your environments. And doing it that way is really uh, powerful. It's really nice because it allows you to say, okay, my CI CD server can have admin credentials into the database, but the application that's running only has the ability to read and write data to specific tables, but it can't delete database tables. So that's a really nice best practice. I love the migrator project. So it's just a little bit about deployment. As far as testing goes, they have integration testing built in. And I, I call it integration testing. They call it unit testing, but it is, it's a bunch of tests in C Sharp that will spin up a database and then make it really easy to call into a, a class and have all of its dependencies automatically populated such that you can call in, it'll call other things, and it'll call into the database, into your in-memory database, and you can simulate actual queries and run those queries. And so I call that an integration test because it's sort of, it's not just testing a really narrow slice of functionality, but it's wonderful. It's a little bit slow, so I wouldn't plan on doing all of your tests this way, but it's wonderful for getting queries, if you have complex queries and you really want integration style testing, it's absolutely fantastic. 
it's based on so so when I do projects I usually have a set of tests just like they provide and then I have a sibling project which is pure unit tests which uses mocking exclusively and, and would never actually hit the database so it uses X unit it has this in memory database I mentioned it uses n substitute I've used moke in previous projects or mock or however you pronounce it but n substitutes just fine just a different syntax and uh, shouldly if you're not familiar with shouldly shouldly is awesome instead of saying Except uh, assert dot r equal and then you pass in a parameter and you pass another parameter it's much more reads like a sentence exception dot message dot should be and then you pass in a, a string that's really nice I love should be love that they threw that in there by default so that's a fairly good look at all of the foundational features that you get with avp dot i o I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to do things and I'd like to actually demo it. So I'm going to start with how to end a backend, how to add backend CRUD. The process here is to add the entity, add it to the database context. I'll show you about the DB context model creating extensions, which is a new thing that's required in ABP.io. And I'm going to give you a little bit of code if you want, which you can short circuit a lot of boilerplate that is sort of necessary. And then you have to add the migration. You can then run the migrator project, add your app service, add your DTOs, register permissions, run the app, see the swagger, and rejoice. And that sounds like a lot, but it's not that bad. I'm going to demo it now really quick, and this is applicable to everybody. And I'm just going to talk through briefly the front end part of it, because Angular is not necessarily applicable to all of my audience. It's only applicable to about a third. Let's do this. I'm going to make a product. So I'm going to go into Entities. There we go. I'm hearing from the full audit aggregate route, as I mentioned earlier. And one of the parameters for that is what data type it is. If I were real data driven design, and by the way, there's a really good Pluralsight course by Deborah Carrada on domain driven design. They, they talk about the importance of doing a GUID, and you can do it that way if you want. The, the benefit there is that in your front end you could create it independently without sending it to the database and you could modify it and make changes to it and then once you're happy with it then send it into the database and you can know that the ID is not going to change. I don't need to do that for this so I'm just going to call it mint. Alright, I mentioned this earlier but if you have enums the right place to put that is inside of shared. All right, we've done step one, added the entity. Now we need to add it to the database context. I'm going to jump over into the Entity Framework core. You'll see I've got a lease stored through DB context. Now I can create a new product there. And check out this description here. It says, hey, don't forget to map them inside of the lease store 3 DB context model creating extensions that blah, 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 blah. Well, all right, we can do that. It's sibling product right there and they give you an example of how to do it so I'm gonna follow their guidelines first and I'll show you a little shortcut if you like okay there we go so this is saying that we have a product and we would like its name to be product and we would like to configure it by convention which picks up um, basically the any annotations that you put on it but then you can also be a lot more specific you can say okay the name field is required and it has a max length of 100 and that's the way they recommend you do it and that's fine you could do it that way however I liked the way they did it in the ASP.NET boilerplate I like the reflection based way of doing it and so I figured out how to do that um, and if you want I'll share this code it's in github There you go. This code is another way of doing it, and this just will auto go through all of the properties inside of your database context that inherit from DB set, and, except for users, and then it's going to loop through them all and call dot to be able and uh, configure by convention. By doing it that way, then you can just put all of your annotations directly on your product. So. 
Okay, so now we ought to be able to just add a migration. So you go into Package Manager Console window. If you're missing that, you can get that in from View Windows. And then make sure to change the default project to DB Migrations. That's important. Things will go wrong if you don't specify that. And then you add migration. Let's take a look over our migration, make sure it looks good. We're trying to add an app product. By the way, that app prefix that came from this new thing, the DB table prefix, which you can change if you want to. And you can also set a default schema. That's also a new thing that's kind of nice. I'm happy with that. We're going to make an identity and all of these columns. Notice the is deleted. We never explicitly added that. That came and the lost modified. All that came from the full audited aggregate group. Looks good to me. Let's run it. I'm going to run it with the DB migrator. All right, it says it completed correctly. Let's just look over in the database real quick. Okay, there it is. Cool. All right. And so we did an add entity, added to the database context, added to the DB context model creating extensions. We added our migration. We chose not to seed the data. We ran the migrator project or called update database. And so that's great. And six is to add the app service. So now we're going to expose that. There we go. CRUD app service. It's going to have a whole bunch of generic parameters we're going to have to fill in. First of all, what is this for? It's for a product. We'll call it a product, DTO, and then int. And the get list input is for pagination and filtering and sorting. And we can do a paged and sorted result request. Then for how to create a new one, uh, we could reuse the product DTO, but it's a best practice to do a create product DTO, a separate one. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's create these classes. Okay, it's complaining now because product DTO should inherit from I entity DTO. We'll do better, one better than that. Entity DTO, and I think it needs a key, so we'll call it int. There we go. And last but not least, once a constructor with a repository. We're almost done, actually. But let's talk about DTOs real quick. The purpose of these DTOs is to not expose anything that we don't accidentally intend to from the entity from the database. So we're only returning those fields that we strictly have to. There's also a benefit that if you have a foreign table, it doesn't know, doesn't automapper doesn't go try to go down that rabbit hole of getting the the you know the product's customer and the customer's customer type and you know like down this whole rabbit tree of all these other things. So we're just exposing only the fields that we strictly need to when we're returning data in the product's DDO. And when we're updating it and inserting it, we're only allowing the front end to insert and update the values that we explicitly are allowing. So if we had like an is admin field, we wouldn't want to accidentally expose that. That's just something that the back end owns exclusively. So, and it prevents a, a number of security vulnerabilities such as overposting. Product DTO will look a lot like our product. And the create one will look just like it, except we're going to be able to put these annotations on it and the annotations will be used for validation. So I'm going to take these and move them into the place that they should be. I mentioned this previously, but those should go into contracts. All right, I think we're about done here. So we've added the app service, we added the DTOs. Oh, permissions. Yeah, let's do permissions. So back here on the app service, let's just do an ABP authorize or just authorize. And we need to create this permission. It doesn't exist yet. So we're going to have a CRUD product. So call it whatever we want. Just following their pattern, these all are going to have a common group name, least or three, and uh, CRUD product. And then we need to register the permission definition provider. Going to register CRUD product. Its display name, which will be used in the UI, will be called. Uh, the final parameter here is optional, but I really would encourage you to always specify it, especially if you're doing multi tenancy, because it's easy to get wrong, and if you get it wrong, it's a kind of a pain to fix. So we want this to be for 
the I don't know we're not really doing multi-tenancy so I'll do both but I think probably more typical if we had a bookstore and we had a multi-tenancy and we were selling multiple bookstores or or whatever we could have this be probably would only be ever in the tenants it would never be in the host because the host is just the person or the account which is creating other hosts usually no, I'm not gonna do both. and I use localization here just as an example actually it's required here I think and permissions crud product is something that I would need to add into en.json and shared. And that's it. We have now completed the last step. Now we got to run the app, see the swagger, and I'm getting ready to rejoice. There it is. There it is. Product. Yes. Excellent. I should hopefully already be logged in, and I might be able to get products. Oh, uh, there it is. Authorization failed. I just pulled up Beartail and then looking in least or three host logs. Why did that fail? It failed because authorization failed. And I bet that if I go into the front end right now and take a look at the user admin, I bet he belongs to the role called admin. And if I view that set of permissions, I need to add view update products save it back and 200 yay so that is running the app seeing the swagger and rejoicing fantastic hey i'm not going to get into the details of the front end too much but there's one thing that i do really want to show that is regenerating the proxies you can follow the guide yourself for how to do the front end for whichever front end you prefer but just one thing that's really cool and that is i can run avp generate dash proxy and that's going to look inside of my swagger file and generate a set of strongly typed product typescript file and a bunch of other things one thing that's really nice about the way ABP does this they used to use nswag in asp.net boilerplate and and so it's wonderful I love it but it would generate one gigantic file and whenever I was doing code reviews on my project the people that were new to the project would come and be like maybe that's a it's an interesting uh, you know four four thousand line or, you know twenty thousand line file or whatever it is that you've got there and you know I know you're a good developer but um you might want to try breaking that on in individual files. And I'd have to explain that, yes, uh, it's probably not a best practice to have 20,000 line files, but that is what's being auto-generated. So I don't really have a lot of choice in the matter. Um, so this is broken out into individual files, which is a, a huge improvement. And I think it's going to be a nice improvement for the IDE as well, for Visual Studio Code. Notice that the enum was generated too, and that's really nice. There we go. It automatically figured that out. So that's going to be strongly typed. Isn't that nice? and the product service i'm going to get a create method and a delete method and a get method and here's my create product dto and my product dto and those are all just just generated for me saves a ton of time love that feature if i was doing this in angular i would add a module i would update the routing there's a new nav component which is how it displays the top nav or it could be the left nav depending on the ui template that you choose um, then you can duplicate their books folder, which you can download from their template. And that's probably a good way to do it. It's tempting as you get started on this project to look at the details as I've started to show you and, and you're thinking, oh gosh, why did they use two spaces instead of four spaces? Or, or why did they put braces on the same line? Or why aren't they doing this? Why didn't they do that? I've had a lot of coworkers that have felt the same way. I've felt the same way at times. And it, Times like these, I think it's really important to take a step back and remember Parkinson's Law of Triviality. Parkinson's Law of Triviality, it's when members of an organization give disproportionate weight to the tiny little detail, the trivial, non-important things. It's also known as bike shedding or missing the forest for the trees. And so if you're tempted to complain about little details, it's important to take a step back and remember everything that you're getting with ABP.io. You're getting localization, pagination, sorting, and all these UI helpers and, and the proxy generation I just showed you. The login, authentication, authorization, the security model is just fantastic. Multi-tenancy is just an enormous feature that's super helpful if you need that. 
the testing, the in-memory database being automatically set up, the database migrator project, the authorization, the domain-driven design base classes, and the CRUD, the auto CRUD that you're getting, server-side validation, uh, client-side validation too, I'll then show that, data annotations and custom validator, that cool user-friendly helper exception, the auto mapper, I didn't show that in as much detail, but the auto mapper is uh, really, really helpful. Modules, dependency injection, auditing, the ability to do soft deleting, and, and auditing is, I mean, auditing is just amazing. The fact that you can see who last updated or created things. The soft delete, the filters, the way the filters work, the repository pattern, the transactions, logging, the data seeding, the signal R, background jobs, the virtual file system, all of that is just a huge amount of fantastic functionality. So I'm a big fan of avp.io and it's remember to important to step back and, and that is uh, how you can hopefully be a superhero on your next ASP.NET project. So that's the end of my presentation. Hope you have learned something and enjoyed. If you found this useful, please like, please subscribe. I generally do a lot of content on ASP.NET Boilerplate, ABP, and these types of technology. And have a wonderful day, week, month, or whatever. I'll talk to you later.